and I'm moderating the October 10th at noon Eastern time uh, summit for uh, peer respite in Soteria houses on a session for like practical issues on what comes up. And uh, so today we're going to just have uh, just a little tease or taste, a preview of what what we're what's coming up on uh, Sunday, October 10th. So I'd like to start with the dean of um, Soteria House, uh, Voice Hendricks, and uh, maybe you could uh, tell us how. How did you deal with uh, the community relations and neighbors? Um, were there issues with uh, noise and disturbances and those kind of things? And how how did you uh, deal with those? Uh, the, the original story, we didn't deal with it at all. We just moved in and I said that I think to the neighbors and the neighbors most uh, we had a house on one side that was residence was rented out normally. Uh, we, I think there was three families during the, the 13 years the Terrier was open, and we were friends, people in the house were friends with all three different levels, but it, it came up through natural kinds of interaction between, between the, you know, the house and someone who were renting the house. The other side was a, a nursing home. Uh, they didn't know we existed until about the fifth year they were over there and that happened because one of our residents rescued one of their patients walking around in the neighborhood lost and he and I took him back to the nursing home and then that way they got to know who we were and they were surprised because they thought we a fraternity, thought we were a fraternity or a, some lap house for some, you know college students uh, and I think the reason why that happened is because no one of our, no, none of the pay, uh, residents in our house were normally medicated. So they looked just like college students going, you know, going to school. And so it, it was a shock to them, but there was never any uh, negative issues between any neighbor uh, that I know of. Great. So you you kind of didn't have any NIMBY not in my backyard issues because you didn't let people know that yeah you were in their backyard to begin with and and didn't and then weren't weren't disruptive neighbors. Yeah. Susan, is that uh, is that uh, your experience for when you got Soteria <laughs> Alaska going and and how did uh, that? Uh, same no, and this is my, no, and this is one I probably should have uh, talked to voice on, but um, our, we were advised. Uh, by, uh, you know, kind of our advisory committee and the folks and our uh, the folks that were working with us and architect and stuff that we should actually uh, introduce ourselves to the neighbors and go to a community meeting. And um, so, but people didn't really understand what we were. So um, they were very opposed. And um, I mean, to the point where one week they were picketing across the street and saying, literally not in my backyard. Um, but, but but what did happen over a period of time is that uh, we eventually did move in there and uh, we, uh, and I gave the entire neighborhood had my no phone number and I would periodically get calls. And one time when we weren't, we hadn't yet moved into the house and there was another group of young people there and she, one neighbor called me up and said, your people are, have a, a fire and it's 11 o'clock at night, which is totally standard in Alaska. And I said, well, that's good, but they're not my people. Uh, I'll be glad to let the landlord know because we hadn't even moved in yet. So it was a bunch of kids living there. So so in the end, it actually worked out really well. And the residents made various neighborhood uh, relationships. Uh, but at first, it was pretty dicey. So I think that's a decision organizations need to make when they're moving forward in Soteria houses and really take stock of what the repercussions can be. Either way, I, I'm not sure that there's right or wrong on this. I think you have to know your neighborhood. So that's it. Great voice and Susan. Um, Morgan, uh, with respect to respite houses, have, have you done any research? Is there any research uh, that you know of about uh, how this works out and how to deal with it? Talking about the neighborhood relationships, that is? Yeah. 
So there actually hasn't been a lot of research in peer respites or soteria houses, as it seems. Um, and for what I know, we don't have any research on, um, you know, neighborhood relationships for the most part, because a lot of the research that is done is done, you know, with guests and or um, the peer support staff themselves. Um, but from my own personal experience of working at a peer respite in California, um, it happens. Yeah. Uh, for both both settings, it sounds like. Well, what do you mean by it happened? Um, so the the peer respite I worked at in California, we had moved neighborhoods. Our first neighborhood had no problem with us. Um, and then we moved neighborhoods and um, quite a few neighbors rallied and, and were trying to um, deal with the county and, and have us not be able to be in their neighborhood because the whole not, a, not in our backyard situation. Um, it ended up being that they had a little bit more issues with our parent company versus um, the program itself, but um, yeah, it, we were not welcome at first, and it took a lot of time building relationships with people and kind of getting to the bottom of who were the organizers, because most of the neighbors didn't mind at all. It was just a few select, very loud voices that caused the issues. And, but you, it ultimately worked out and you were accepted in the neighborhood? Yes, yes. Great. So, um, now, Alan, Jen, you you were um, trying to uh, get Soteria houses going, and I'm curious if um, if this issue, uh, Jen, has uh, come up uh, for you and your group, and and how you're dealing with it. Uh, well, just to say, first of all, I I did uh, help to open a small Soteria, oh, right. it was a pilot project, and. Um, in some ways, we were lucky in that the house was my house, and I, which is probably very unusual, and I let it out for a satiri house. So I've been there for a long, long time, many, many years. So I knew all the neighbours, and I talked to them about it beforehand, and uh, they were all very supportive because they knew why I was doing it. Yeah, so I was lucky there. Um, I don't think that's going to apply in in future situations but i think it's something that we will be aware of and i really think it's important as much as possible with any house to start working with the local community rather than come from the outside and something that's been planted in that's that's what we're hoping to do with both of the groups in the uk that are in the process of working towards opening houses um, and I think probably before before it opens up as a satiri house, invite neighbours in and get get to know them. And you may find that neighbours really want to be very supportive and help. Because I found the more we actually talk about the things that are important to Soteria and, and about what the alternatives are, i.e. what the, the existing services are like, I generally find that pe that many people understand and they want to help and they want to support. So I think the more we can find time to, to talk to neighbours and, and the community in general in, the, in an informal way, I think sometimes we can um, find we've got a lot of supporters out there who, who want to help us. But let's see. Great. Now, Al, I'm not sure if you're uh, at the point where that's an issue, but I, I understand that you're really working policymakers and uh, like legislators and other people in New Mexico. And so how how are you finding uh, that going and, and what are you doing to get support for um, opening one or more Soteria houses in uh, New Mexico, United States? Well, we're making some progress, Jim. We're pretty early in the, in, in the uh, process, I think. But uh, what we've done, uh, uh, we've gotten a group of people together, about 12 people um, who, are, who are supportive and can help out. Uh, one of the things that happened is that the, um, the local behavioral health collaborative, which is all of the uh, providers, um, the providing agencies, the clinics, and other people uh, including law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera, are putting together a strategic plan, a strategic plan to build the ideal behavioral health system in Doniana County. And so uh, I became part of that process along with some other people. And we have Soteria included in 
the strategic plan as a game changing new program. So anytime a community is doing a strategic plan or working on how can we improve the system, I think it's a good idea for people who want Soterias to get involved and to let people know about Soteria because one of the things I'm finding, Jim, is that people know that we really don't have good treatment for people who are diagnosed with psychosis. Uh, we just have not been able to help people uh, experiencing that kind of state of being, let's call it, they call it a mental illness. We just don't have good treatment. I mean, the recovery rate uh, for people diagnosed with that is way less than 20%. And in Soteria, you're talking about a recovery rate of 60%. And people know that. They know that we don't have a good treatment program. And so uh, that is one thing you can point out. This is an effective alternative. The other thing we're doing is involving state legislators, because I believe that these approaches should be part of the state's um, mental health system. And so we've talked to the head of the Behavioral Health Services Division uh, in Santa Fe. Uh, we made a presentation to a legislative committee uh, about Soteria, and there was quite a bit of interest in it. And uh, because we also believe that we're going to need money, especially for the first year, we need between 800000 and a million dollars to finance the first year. And we think the state of New Mexico is the best source we have for that. So I would say that's where we are. We're moving so that's forward. So great. that's great. And everybody, uh, boys, Susan, uh, Morgan, Jen, and um, Al, thanks so much. Um, it's these kind of practical issues that we're going to talk about on October 10th, it's starting at noon Eastern time. Uh, and uh, so I, um, that hopefully will be helpful to, to people that are interested in have the type of information that you can get uh, to to persuade policymakers and funders that this is something that should be done. So um, that's what we're going to do on October 10th. Uh, more to come. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.